everyone. This is Mike Dixon, a.k.a. Farmer Mike. Yes. Um, he is here to talk to us about local food and why it matters. Um, you're eating food from Juice Plate, which is, um, maybe you can talk a little about the partnership that you have yes. with Juice Plate as well. Um, and uh, just so everyone knows, Mike, like everybody else, is donating his time today and his very valuable expertise. So, Mike, take it away. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Michael Dixon. We, um, we started a nonprofit about four years ago called um, Seed of Life Nurseries. Um, we use Seed of Life Nurseries to help a lot of the families in our community um, have access to healthy foods, um, healthy produce, and uh, we teach them how to grow and sustain their own gardens and um, with the prospect of helping them grow and sustain, sustain themselves you know, as they come through our programs. Um, we started with just a, a small nursery on the side of our house, and we grew flowers. Um, in growing the flowers, we noticed, um, well, let me step back here a little bit. Uh, when we grew the flowers, we grew them for fundraisers, for churches and local organizations, and we always had extra flowers. So we took these extra flowers out into the community throughout um, Section 8 housing, low-income areas, and we tried to make the area more beautiful for people so they have more... Um, more respect, more admiration for their area. If you make something pretty, people pay attention to it. When people start to pay attention, your crime rate starts to go down a little bit. So that's um, growing up in Section 8 housing when I was a kid and growing up on welfare, um, I, I know how these trends act. So um, when we start taking flowers out to these neighborhoods, we start building friendships up with some of the families. And in doing that, we realized there was a bigger need for fresh foods, there was a bigger need for food in these communities because a lot of these kids, um, when we went out to plant flowers, I would take extra vegetables from our house and, you know, give them to people. And people readily took them and they always asked for more if we had more. So I told my wife, well, maybe we should start growing more vegetables and giving out into the community. And um, in doing that, I said, why don't we just start doing a farm project? And she said, are you crazy? And I said, yes, you know, you married me. <laughs> so we started... Um, Seed of Life Nurseries, with the hopes of growing food. And in growing the food, we knew we had to make some kind of money because I couldn't spend all the money that I made through my landscape business um, on what we were doing because it, it took a lot of money to do what, you know, what we were doing. So we started our Seed of Life Nursery CSA, which I don't have the papers in front of me. They're downstairs. Um, when we started our CSA, what we did is we told people, if you sign up and we gave them a, a decent price for 28 weeks, um, you will be able to adopt another family. So when you sign up, you feed another family also. And it worked out great. We got our first year, I think we got 40 sign-ups, and that was about 40 families we were able to feed. And it worked out really good. We grew the food for 80-plus families, and um, people really enjoyed that. So in doing that, I told my wife, you know, it's good that we are able to give food to people, but we need to have them give something back to the community too. You know, we just can't give a handout all the time. So we start bringing the kids and the moms and the families um, to the farms um, with the idea that if they give back a little bit, it's going to come back to them, you know, later down the road. And um, it worked out. Some of the families, not all the families, of course, came out in the beginning, but a lot of them came out and they enjoyed it and the kids loved it. And we started growing from there. So from four to five years ago to now, we feed over 100 families every season. And um, these families bring their kids out to the farms. Um, we started a big summer program this year to where we brought those kids out specifically for the whole summer every day. And um, yes, and they came and they worked on the farm and they learned about healthy food nutrition and they learned about farming and they learned about drug prevention. And with the partnerships through um, a bunch of different organizations, we were able to mentor these kids and give them something to look forward to as they got older. Um, what we realize as a nonprofit is we need money. And in needing money, one of my biggest pet peeves is reaching out for federal money. Because if I'm trying to bring these folks off of the federal assistance, why would I reach my hand out into that too? You know, that's kind of a, an oxymoron to me. So we asked private businesses, we asked local foundations, local charities to help us out. If they couldn't help us out with money, then we need labor hours. We need people to come out and help us. So people started to really see and identify um, what we were doing, and we got local money for that. Local businesses, you know, I approached them and told them, 
if you invest in these children now, that's going to be your long-term investment 10 years down the road because they're going to come back and work for you or they're going to come back and buy your product. And they like that. They like how I pitch that. So we have local businesses now that support what we're doing in our endeavors. And um, our biggest goal is to be more self-sustaining. So in doing that, we started growing more vegetables, um, reaching out to the restaurants and um, selling vegetables to local restaurants. And we actually started the juice plate, which that's what you guys are eating now, is... Um, the juice plate is basically a soup, salad, and shop with a juice bar and a sandwich shop, of course. And um, we use produce that I can grow, and we use produce from other local farmers that grow. And the cool thing is, is we reach out to them and try to get them to come in rather than them trying to, you know, find some place to get rid of that excess produce. Um, we reach out to them because I know a lot of the farmers in the area through a lot of the events that I do. And it gives them a venue to get rid of the food. Um, that they have overages of so it doesn't go to waste, which we all know we hate waste. We're, we're trying to be more greener, more, you know, earth friendly. Um, you can either feed it to the pigs or you can feed it to a family that really needs it. So um, they sell the vegetables to us at a discounted rate. We're able to use them in our restaurant and we're able to help the families that we help too. So um, one of our biggest things um, that we try to push people is investing in your local community. Through our nonprofit, you know, we reinvest whenever we need anything. We try to reinvest everything that we, we have in our local businesses that help us. Um, we advertise for our local businesses. When people ask me about questions of if they need something, I have a, a slew of cards and a, a little index, and I'll, I'll go through and find local businesses that will help them. Um, I'm very advantageous in trying to create a, a network of people that will help other people. So um, it was just only fitting for me to partner with Patty Brown to open the, the juice plate. And as a social enterprise of Seed Life Nurseries, we can utilize that space that we have not only to create a, a viable business that funds Seed Life Nurseries, but we create an outlet in order to educate the kids that are in our neighborhoods. Um, we take them from the farm field where they're learning about their veggies, how they're growing, what the vitamin contents, to preparing the foods and knowing what foods to put together to make it taste really good, but how it's really going to impact your body the best ways, too. So um, here in the future, we're going to be taking, usually it's going to be the older kids. We've done this in the past. Um, Barbara Fritchie Restaurant is a, a very big supporter of us. They buy a lot of veggies from us. Um, they let us use their kitchen in the past um, to do little dinners for the kids. And we'll take the kids, we've taken the kids, I should say, there and they've made dinners for their moms and dads at the end of the season. Well, what we're doing, which is really cool, I'm telling you what, when, a, when you have these five to 15 year old kids in this kitchen, we got these wonderful pictures on our Facebook and they're chopping and they're slicing and they're throwing stuff in the pot. It gives them a sense of pride that they can give back to their families. Um, when they come out to our farm fields, they get to take veggies home. And that's a really cool thing. But when you give them the access to learn how to cook the veggies, you're giving them another step to or another tool to be able to supply to their families. And it's, it's really a good character building tool that we do with them. Um, what we're doing is we're actually going to do culinary art classes for those older kids. So they will be able to learn how to cook with the food, um, talk about what the food you know, does for your body. And we're going to take those few kids that we pick and they're going to teach the other kids, and they're going to teach the moms, and they're going to be able to give back to their community um, to build social skills. And, of course, that looks good on scholarships, too. So um, one of our big aspirations is some of the local chefs have talked about helping us with this. We're going to take those chefs and bring them in, and they're going to teach the kids about the culinary arts and hopes to create some kind of um, position for these kids later in their restaurants, too. So if these kids really don't go off to college, they can still create a position for themselves in the local restaurants and learn about the culinary arts there and um, just really just try to build them up a little bit more than what they're, you know, what they have in their own neighborhoods. So um, any questions? I know that's a lot of information, you know, in such a short time, but. I'll just, I always take it from. Nope, you're fine. Yes. Um, can you talk a little bit more about, um, I mean, I, as I was researching this, and also just because I've always been interested, I mean, I was reading things like, you know, the, the length of time that the typical, like when you go to the grocery store and you buy yes. produce, how old that food is, and how the nutritional value depletes so quickly yes. while it's sitting and waiting for you to buy it. And and um, and just also, you know, the, 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 the big industrial farms versus 
the smaller local farms. I read that Maryland has more local small farms than any state in the U.S. It they do. the heck out of me. So can you compare and contrast just the nutritional value and the impact on the overall economy of doing things locally versus Definitely. on a bigger scale? Well, not only does it reduce the petroleum costs and, of course, greenhouse emissions and such that a lot of people have big concerns with, but like you were saying, the nutritional value of the food is so much better for you when you buy it locally. When you can go to a farmer's market and the food's been picked either that day or that night before, um, your vitamin content is a lot more, um, what should we say, more potent than what it would be from something that was shipped in and sat for a week. After each day that that vegetable was picked and put on a shelf, you're losing over 20% of the nutritional value each day. So basically, if you get something from the grocery store that's sat there for over a week, you're only getting, if that, 30% of the nutritional value of that vegetable, all you're eating is fiber. <laughs> you're just putting fiber in. It's just filler. So it's better for you to be able to get the fresh vegetables um, that are local because you're going to get more bang for your buck, basically. You're going to get more nutritional value out of that vegetable than something that's been shipped one or two weeks. Um, Small farms versus big farms. We, I, I tell you what, um, big farms, there's, there's a lot more, um, there can be a lot more risks with big farms and small farms. Um, you know, it's very debatable. A lot of people tell you, you know, it goes one way or the other. But when you have, when you're dealing with a bigger farm, and if you're dealing with a conventional farmer, of course, you have a lot of petroleum-based fertilizers. You have a lot of things that they're using that really shouldn't be used on food the insecticides, um, your, your fertilizers that are harsh, um, the herbicides that they're using to kill out the field, you know, all that stuff sits in your soil. Um, a lot of the smaller farmers um, are going towards organic or all natural methods in which they're trying to get away from the, the big fertilizers. They're trying to get away from the harmful pesticides. One of the big initiatives that we're trying to do is get people used to eating food that isn't perfect or pretty. Um, in my CSA, I, we put in that paper, um, everything that you eat, isn't going to be beautiful. It might be a little ugly. It might have a nick on it. But that's because we don't use anything that's going to kill you later down the road on those vegetables. Everything's all natural. If, I, if I'm afraid to go out in my field and pick something and eat it right there, why would I give it to you? You know, my children are out there picking and eating. We have hundreds of kids that come out every year picking and eating. And I don't, I don't want to be responsible for something harmful to them later in their lives. So... A lot of the farmers are starting to do this, and they're starting to realize that. And you see a lot of farmers out there that are trying to get um, certified to be organic farms. And you're getting a lot of farmers who are saying, you know what, we're all natural now. We're not using the crazy pesticides and the harmful fertilizers. You know, they're, they're resorting to you know, composting and green manures and you know, cover crops. And this is a good thing. This is what you know, our grandfathers did. You know? And if they've done it for centuries, why can't we do that? You know? So that's, that's one, a, a really good push that the smaller farms in Maryland, and Maryland Department of Agriculture is, it does a wonderful job promoting the smaller farmers. So in doing that, more farmers are seeing that, and they're wanting to gravitate towards that because they can see the benefits financially um, and the advertising benefits of using the Maryland Department of Agriculture to advertise their farms. Um, economically, it, it's better for you. It's better for them. It's better for their small communities. Um, the, the whole you know, Go Local Maryland uh, initiative is really powerful right now. And we have a lot of people, especially at our farmer's markets, that will come in and say, are you, are you locally grown? You know, what methods are you using? And it's good because the people are educating themselves to um, buy things that are more local and that are more beneficial to their bodies. Um, the second question, what was that? I apologize. I think you covered them both, but I okay. Yeah. But actually, one of the things I've never read that I always thought is a big reason is in, in many of the European countries, the lifestyle isn't to go to the store and pack the refrigerator full of food. For no, it's weeks. not. You go on your way home from work to the market and you pick up your food and you take it home and you cook it. Exactly. And, and, I, I and they're long, buying. I've long thought that it's been the fresh, more nutritious food that has helped contribute to them being healthier. And that's food. exactly it. And in our, in our lifestyles, we... Um, uh, sadly enough, we call it being Americanized to where you want to buy a lot of things really cheap and you want to buy things that are preserved so it lasts a long time. Um, 
we as a community have a big problem with hoarding. <laughs> and we want to hoard food, so in case there's you know, some kind of crazy epidemic, we have a lot of food saved, or we just we have this impulse to, to buy a lot of stuff. So we go you know, to the preservatives, and we buy things that are preserved. We buy things that um, have a lot of acids in them, that, or we have things that have a lot of phosphates in them. And like you said, in a lot of the European countries, a lot of their stuff is all natural. They're, they're, you know, they've kept that for so many years, whereas we've marketed you know, TV dinners you know, back in the 60s. The, the big TV dinner epidemic, as I call it, came out, and people thought, oh, this is an easy way to store food, and we don't have to cook. You know, that, takes, that takes less time to cook and more time to watch TV or more time to do act, other activities. And what we tried to do is train the people that are in our CSA and the people that, are, that we take care of and the families that we adopt to have fun with your family by cooking. Um, we give recipes out. Um, we give fun facts out about some of the foods that they're not used to. We try to get people more interactive with the food, um, especially the, the things that we have readily, like Swiss chards. Because you can only eat so much Swiss chard one way. So you've got to have lots of different recipes for Swiss chard, because we've had Swiss chard for six weeks now. <laughs> but um, And your lettuces. you know, A lot of people don't realize that you can actually put a lot of the, the dark green leafy lettuces that we grow, the baby lettuces, in soups. And it's great. It tastes good. Um, you can use them, you can stir fry them, you can do a lot of different things with them, but it's just a matter of having that knowledge. And one good thing, like I said, about the Maryland Department of Agriculture and other farmers is, is we're starting to train people to eat better by giving them the, the access to the recipes and access to the information to do different things with it. Um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> How are you giving them access to the recipes? Our website. Um, we actually have, uh, on our website, we have recipes, um, quite a few recipes that we use. Um, we don't put a recipe up unless we've used it. And if we don't like it, we're not going to put it on the website. So there's a lot of different recipes that we put on there. Um, we advertise for a lot of other websites. Um, one, one that we use is cooks.com. Um, I love that website. We get on there and we find all kinds of really cool um, recipes. But one thing I tell people, when you find these recipes, you don't have to follow that recipe exact. Um, we, we tweak it the way we would like it. If there's something in there you don't like, don't put it in there. Add something different. You know, Own the recipe. You don't have to cook anything exactly like it says. You can tweak it a little bit to make it the way you like it. And it's, it's, it's really beneficial to our, our clients you know, to What's give them that information. Website? My website is uh, solsoulnurseries.org. Okay. And you can get on our website, and we'll have the recipes there. And we have information about our CSA and our projects and our programs and everything. Plus, you can get on our uh, Facebook. Um, Mama puts um, recipes on the Facebook, and she'll actually do snapshots of um, different steps, like she did spaghetti squash lasagna. And a lot of people don't know how to cook with spaghetti squash, but she actually took pictures of the different steps, and she was able to you know, create just a, a, a little form or whatnot about how to make that and what it looks like before and after. And a lot of our clients tried it, and they loved it. We, I, my spaghetti squash um, sales have probably tripled <laughs> this year because of that recipe. But um, it's, it's just a, a great way to get information out there through our website. And we, we encourage other farmers to start their own little websites and Facebooks too because the more interactive you are with your community, the, the better off your community is going to support you. So. Yes. And not wanting to take federal funding. Yes. Uh, and then you also mentioned social enterprise. You, yes. You've got a lot of different things going on there. We we've recently launched a, a firm, and we are teetering and pottering behind the idea of do we do we five hundred one c three it? Do we tie our hands by being a nonprofit? Or do we stay a social profit company? Yeah. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the challenges of being a nonprofit. Okay. That you think maybe. I'll be honest with you. I haven't seen any challenges of being a nonprofit. Um, the only challenge is you can't be greedy. You can't take that money out of the nonprofit, you know, and you can't consider it as profit. You know, it has to be invested in it, and you have to pay yourself accordingly. And I think one thing in our society is we, we were built on capitalism, but then after a while it got distorted and it turned into a greedyism, as I say. You know, it's a funky word, I know. But um, people thought if you make more money, you're going to be more happier, and that's not the case. Um, you can make money as a nonprofit and by doing social enterprise like Patty and I are doing with the juice plate and be able to create um, 
commerce. You're able to create money, but that money is, uh, goes back into creating new jobs. Uh, some of the money goes back into paying us, of course, but we don't see it as, oh, well, we're going to make all this money and live the big high life. No, we're going to make all this money so we can live comfortably, but also help other people and build them up. And in doing that, we're going to be able to create new business. We'll, um, she'll be able to go off and create new um, stores, and we'll be able to fund those stores and supply those stores you know, through our farms, and I'm able to go off and create the aquaponics, um, which the Alley Mall Foundation, it's a local foundation, they funded the farm that we live on now, and they also, they're also funding the aquaponic project. So I will also have these aquaponic greenhouses that grow tilapia and trout and perch, and they fertilize the fresh greens. So we're able to grow the produce and the fish, and we're able to supply restaurants, and all that money comes back into the nonprofit, and I'm able to pay myself. You know, eventually I'll be able to pay myself, I should say. <laughs> um, but what it does is it, it, keeps, it keeps a lot of checks and balances there, whereas if you keep it as one business, in my opinion, you, you know, there's not a lot of checks and balances. When you have a, a totaler, uh, um, what, what can I say, totalerism, what's it called? Totalitarianism, there you go. Sorry, I'm trying to break out big words. I should have checked that. But um, then one person controls everything, and there's no checks and balances there. With our nonprofit, you know, we don't have this great big board, but we have a few people that advise us, and they keep our checks and balances. And, you know, between myself, my, my vice president, which is my wife, and my treasurer, which is my brother-in-law, we're able to say, hey, is this good? Is this bad? What do we think? And nobody can put their hands, dip, dip their hands in the cookie jar. In my opinion, I like the nonprofit aspect. Um, we're able to create more jobs through our nonprofit now that we're creating these social enterprises and creating these new businesses and partnerships. Um, I myself don't see a problem with it. Um, as a nonprofit, the, the nonprofits that are out there to look for funding and charities all the time and charitable donations, mm -hmm. they have a situation because a lot of times um, you have a high overhead of um, salaries. Um, versus, you know, trying to find a way to create uh, monies to pay the salaries. They're always trying to reach out to other foundations, federal money, government money, and, you know, get that money through donations. We're not trying to do that. Any kind of donations that come to us, we, we call it seed money. And that, in, that investment helps us grow to be more independent from having to take more money from people. So when people invest their money in us, we actually are seeing it as growth potential so we can create the more jobs that we need. Yeah, it's like you sidestep the, the number one challenge with the nonprofits is the grant system. Exactly, <laughs> and that's what we're trying to do. Yeah. And those, those companies and foundations that we approach for money right now because we are small and we do need the capital, whereas we couldn't go out and get a loan. But if we can go out and get a, a small grant or a small donation from local businesses or local you know, foundations, the grants that we need, um, that gives us the stepping stones to create more growth in our fields, to create more growth in our restaurants. And that growth will help provide the monies we need to support ourselves. So. Yeah, we should maybe, the three of us, or maybe the four of us, talk a bit after this. But I know Glenn and I just talked with our accountant um, about that very same thing. If we, if we were looking at maybe doing Cohort Frederick as a nonprofit or maybe a benefit corporation, um, and actually, we were scared away from it because of the idea of the board and potentially losing control and, yeah. and, and you know, and, and the paperwork and the, you know, all that stuff. But, but the idea of being labeled as something that's good, right, and, and the idea of, frankly, being able to get people to contribute to your cause, because yes. you don't really plan to make a whole lot of money anyway, you know, so maybe we'll, maybe we'll have a little power on after this. Cool. Well, thank you. It's one that we're always working on. <laughs> yeah. No, it's just something we've we've been learning. And one thing that people are afraid of, and I'm never afraid of, is making mistakes. Um, that's you know, unfortunately, people don't excel in this in the society because they're afraid of doing something wrong, or they think about it too much, and they think about what will go wrong rather than what will go right if they just keep going. And I'm very thick-headed, and I just keep pushing. And um, we might make a mistake. I'll ask for forgiveness. I'll do what I need to re repair it. And then I go on and, and just build off of that. Um, if more people have that mentality, 
um, there'll be more successful people in our society. And that's what we try to teach the young children, too. So when they're out in the farm fields, we tell them, you know, if, they, if, they, if we see that they make a mistake in the field, if they pull the wrong vegetable and they kind of try to hide it, you know, we'll approach them like, hey, did you realize you were pulling the carrots rather than the, the hemlock? And they'll be like, well, I kind of noticed it when I seen the little carrot. I said, well, let me tell you something. If you pull that carrot, you're taking away from somebody else. But in that, if you apologize and ask for forgiveness, we can replant that carrot and it may come back later. Never be afraid to, to apologize or ask for forgiveness for what you do, but also remember that you can fix it and it, something will come from that later down the road. And they get that. So you, you get these little kids out there and they're pulling stuff and they're like, oh, Farmer Mike, I pulled a vegetable. I'm like, that's okay, man. Let's replant it. We'll, we'll put a little water on it, put a little compost in it. It'll grow back later. And they like that. They know that if you affirm them in their mistakes and tell them, you know what, what you did was wrong, but it's okay because we can learn from that, um, it builds them up to be stronger leaders later. And if we can do that with our older society, you know, as I say, you know, the above 21 crowd, um, they can learn from that too. I think so many times we, we don't affirm people when they make mistakes. We want to ridicule them. And if we can go through and tell people, you know what, you made a mistake. We understand that. Pay restitution deal with it, and go on with yourselves. Learn from that mistake. And um, I think we'll be better as a society and better as businesses if we can do that. Yeah, so. That's great. A couple more questions for me. You, um, in a model that like Maryland has, where you have lots of smaller farmers, do you find that there's a greater variety in the kinds of things that are being grown versus you know, going back to the big industrial farm where you have yes. like this generic seed? Do you, and, and do you actually talk to each other to make sure that you have some variability in what you're planting um, to keep the overall ecology healthy? That's question number one. I'll let you answer that, and then I have a second question. Okay. Um, I talk to a lot of farmers about what we're planting. Um, some of the farmers, uh, some of the smaller farmers who are um, more in tune with what I'm doing, we share a lot of information with each other. Um, I tell them in my area what's growing better, um, what's not growing so good. And then I tell them my methods. One thing that um, I've noticed about some of the other farmers versus some of the ones that are more, I should say, hippie-ish like me, um, they, they try to keep it a secret, and you can't do that. you got to share information. If you want to build up our, our economy and you want to build up what we're doing and the varieties that we have, you have to share information. I share with everybody. I tell people what websites I use for my seed, um, the, the credibility, how the seed viability when it's out in the field. If people ask me what methods I use, I readily share that information. And I do that because if I share that with them, they're going to come back and help me later down the road. It's, it's about giving and taking later. Um, it's, a, it's about um, creating a, a co-living atmosphere with what we're doing. Um, that's a lot of what our communities did a long time ago, and we need to bring that back. Um, now, there's some farmers who don't want to share any kind of information, and their success will be limited. And unfortunately, you know, they might thrive for a decade. They might even thrive for a little longer. But when they don't share that information, as they get older, it's going to die with them. Right. And, you know, that hurts, our, that hurts our economy. That hurts our society as a whole. Would, would you, for example, purposely plant a different variety of tomato than the farms around you so that disease would no. knock out all of them? Or? No, not at all. Um, it, on, the, on the scale that we're growing on and the, the distance between all the different farms, um, that's, not a, that's not a big problem. Now, if you're farming 200 acres of tomatoes and then there's another big farmer growing another you know, 50 to 100 acres of tomatoes, then you got a big issue there. But with the, the different um, seeds that we're using, the different varieties that we're using, um, the bigger variety that you use, the less problems you're going to have with um, different varieties dying out. You might have one variety die out, but you've planted another variety of that same species. Within your same farm. Within so your same farm. About that farm being different because within your own farm, you're yes. variability. Exactly. Yes. Health factors. So, is is there something to the food being fresh and from farms, and you know, maybe a more vegetable content that makes your diet more alkaline? Yes, definitely. And then can you talk a bit more? Well, I can talk about it a little bit. I'm not very versed on, on alkalinity diets, but I do know. 
that a lot of the greens that you eat and a lot of the, the vegetables that you're eating are alkaline based. And there's been, you know, there's been a lot of studies about eating more veggies and keeping in juicing and keeping a more alkaline diet through vegetables um, to sustain your body. One thing that people don't realize is, especially women, if you have a lot of acid in your bodies, um, that acid keeps you dehydrated. Um, you can't absorb water in your body because your acid levels are so high. So women go around dehydrated. Women have more urinary tract infections. Um, it's, a, it's an epidemic. It really is. Um, if you can keep your pH at a steady or a stable you know, rate, um, your body's going to do better for you. Um, so many packaged foods that we eat, um, processed foods, um, colas, they have a lot of acid in them. Um, that acid throws your body off. Your body is meant to keep an alkaline, um, a low alkaline stability, I'm sorry, a high alkaline, low pH. Um, when you mess with that, then your body's thrown off kilter. All kind of bad things can happen in your body. So. When your jewelry starts turning on you, making yep. you take it flat, you're, you're way too acid. Exactly. So. That's one of the signs. If you see your, if you see your you know, metal on your wash turning your skin black, yep. you, you, you've been having too much acid too. Exactly. That's and the acids... And, you know, we taught our kids out in the farm field, um, when you get sunlight or if you eat things that are high in vitamin D, that vitamin D is able to be stored in your liver. Um, that's why we tell people, if you come out to the farm, we're only helping you live better <laughs> because you're getting that sunshine that your body needs. And that vitamin D is what you need to um, latch on to calcium to absorb into your, your blood systems and your bones and everything. When you have a high acidic diet, um, it counteracts with the vitamin D and the calcium. So, you know, there's a lot of bad things that can happen in your body when you have, uh, you know, a, a really high acidity. So, yeah. I can imagine what your answer is going to be with this, and I'm going to throw it out anyway. What's that? What percent of GMOs? No. <laughs> <laughs> is this going viral? <laughs> um, genetically modified products we do not use. Um, just because when you genetically modify something, um, you're, you're tampering with, you're, depending on what your beliefs are, my beliefs is if you're tampering with genetically modified vegetables, you're tampering, tampering with what God created for me. Um, I don't like that. Um, it's, uh, you, if you're tampering with nature like that, like there's some varieties of vegetables. I can't think of them right now, and I don't know who did it, but um, they've put um, squid DNA in some of these varieties of vegetables or these plants, and they plant them, they plant them in the fields. And they did this as a test. So when the plants were dehydrated, they turned a different color because of the squid DNA. Now, can you imagine eating those plants? And I can't go on record to say what it was. I just know there's somebody in the agriculture department that told me about this, and it was very, I was very you know, curious about what it was. But um, he was telling me that you know, these vegetables that they're planting with that squid DNA, um, he, he couldn't guarantee that it would be beneficial to your body because you're, you're tampering with something, you know. Um, in my honest opinion, for so many centuries, we've been taking something and growing it, and then we can mix it naturally with, an, with another of its own species, and it comes out to be beneficial to our body. But if you go through and you're, you're messing with its DNA, how can we be guaranteed that that's going to be beneficial, beneficial to us 10 years down the road, 15 years down the road? So we... It scares me too. That's mucking around with stuff without really fully understanding the consequences. Exactly. And the technology of it is really cool. It's cool. It's cool, but is it? When you start thinking about mixing squid DNA with plant DNA, kind of sort of go, well, what's what is the long term? And you're creating a whole other species that we don't know. Exactly. Well, and what's also scary is there's there's no way to prevent those those altered. Unless, you, unless they grow sterile, you can't prevent them from mixing with these well, other plants. Then again, they have yeah. grown sterile plants, and they've turned fertile uh, after a, a period of generations. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, they'll be sterile for two, three, four generations, but then plants are, are they're, made to, yeah. they're, they're made to be, yeah, to reproduce. So they, yeah. they, repro they start reproducing after a while. So but Yeah, I wonder about, you know, I, I purposely seek out soybeans that are non-GMO, but um, from what I've read, it's becoming more and more difficult because it is. this whole, the, the, I mean, there's so many genetically modified soybeans out well, there. Well, there's so many businesses. It's spreading. Yes. Yeah. One other thing that we, yeah. Yeah. Who, yeah. Who, One who thing that we have to be conscious of, too, is um, who's controlling our seed banks. Yeah. 
that's a big thing too. When you have big corporations and big businesses going around the world trying to buy seed banks so they can er basically eradicate all these different varieties and so their patented varieties stay in play, it's, it's a bad thing. We need variety in our life. If we have only one or two varieties of a certain vegetable, when an epidemic or uh, an invasive disease comes through, it eradicates everything. Then we're left to depend on big government and big corporations to feed us. And that's a bad, that's a, a scary analogy. We've seen that, if any of you have ever read the Bible, when there's a famine, who's in control? <laughs> so. During the winter, what are we supposed to eat? Actually, um, we plant our cold crops. Everything you see in the springtime, which is your cabbage, kales, lettuces, um, any of your brassica families, which are your cabbage, kales, and collards, they will actually overwinter in your fields or in your own gardens. Um, the, the Karsh, uh, if you ever notice, you can freeze cabbage, and when you bring it out, it doesn't get wilty. That's the same with kales and Brussels sprouts and everything. Yeah, so you can actually leave them in your gardens, and you can eat that through the winter time. Uh, the winter time I'm sorry. Um, another good thing is yams or sweet potatoes. You can store those. Um, potatoes you can store for the winter time. Well, do you have a, a garbage bag at home? Do you have a big garbage bag? You can use that as a garden. You can actually take that garbage bag, fill it full of compost or topsoil, tie the top, poke holes around it, and grow your own garden. Um, I've seen 100 pounds of uh, sweet potatoes and 100 pounds of uh, regular potatoes grown in a garbage bag before. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's as easy as doing, you know, creating your own urban garden. Um, if you have a patio that has a little bit of sunlight, um, if you have a partial shady area, you can grow lettuce. Um, if you have the access to take that bag and cover it with plastic, you can create your own little greenhouse. There's a bunch of different ways to grow your own food or store like butternut squashes. Um, we have some pumpkins, like your, your cheddar wheel pumpkins and your Cinderella pumpkins, which are really awesome to eat. Even though they're all bubbly and look pretty, they're actually very nutritious for you. They'll last over eight months if you store them in a, a, a cold, dry area. So... Well, with the pumpkins, the pumpkins, it's better for you. The pumpkins actually store better. It's the, it's the products like um, lettuces, um, thin-skinned vegetables that um, would wilt really quick or decompose really quick. Those break down very quickly. There's different things. Apples, um, after a period of times, apples will go bad, but they'll, they'll last a little bit better for you. Your squashes, they last longer for you, and the vitamin content is, is, is is okay over a period of time. There's some that perish really quick, and there's some that break down over a period of time. So, so a wood or a dirt cellar is good to store things in? It is. It is, yes. Because that's the root cellar. The root cellar, exactly. Basements. You know, your original basement, basements were called root cellars, and that's where they stored their potatoes and their squashes and things that got them through the wintertime. So, so it's pretty neat. Beautiful. I've got a 25 by 30 yard wood. Sweet. You're telling me my greenhouse status will be edible through the winter? It could be, yes. Now, it depends on how cold it gets. Um, now, if you, if you have a, a small greenhouse that you're growing your lettuce in there, if you can keep the, the temperature, you know, above freezing, you know, at like 34 to 38 degrees um, with a small greenhouse, it will last all winter long for you. Exactly, exactly. So if you have a small greenhouse and if you can keep it warm, and we've, we've done things like put, um, they have um, heat wire. Um, it's these long extension cords that actually heat up. We put those in our beds. Um, we've taken compost, lots of compost, and surround the sides of the greenhouses with compost. So um, that bacteria breaks down. It creates heat. Um, it keeps the soil warm. It keeps your plants viable. Um, there's, a, there's a bunch of different ways, and I tell people, go to YouTube. YouTube has a lot of creative ways to keep, um, to grow vegetables, to keep your vegetables safe, you know, through the winter time, or a lot of different urban gardening techniques to really help you with what you're doing at home. So um, you can, like a couple winters ago when the, the temperatures only got down to like 25 maybe, um, we had lettuces growing all winter long. Um, lettuce can survive a, a few really good cold snaps and it'll still grow back. Um, cabbages, man, we were growing cabbages and Swiss chard like there was no tomorrow. Um, we just had readily, you know, available kales and cabbages throughout the winter time. So unless it gets like Ohio weather, where I'm, that, you know, originally from, you know, it gets 20 below zero, 
then of course it's harder to grow lettuces, but you can still have your, your cold crops like your, your brassicas and kales, cabbages, collards and stuff. So, cool. cool. Your next project should be some urban gardening. I Actually, we're doing that. Um, via the, the juice plate for advertising and our new farm, we're gonna hold um, workshops out at the farm for the community now. Since we're in one stable place, we can actually have people come out, and we'll do um, eight to ten week sessions. Once a week, people will come out and learn about what we're doing, and um, they'll be able to take, you know, activities, homework as we call it, home, to where they'll start their own gardens, and then we can track the, the success of that. Yeah. It's so. amazing what you can grow in even the tiniest place. I, I exactly. Yep. Just in a little bit of dirt in there, they come up and they, they put strings around them. Yep. And then there's this little, it's probably about maybe four feet long and maybe, maybe six inches deep. Yep. <laughs> and, they, and they have tomato plants. And those little plants are producing tomatoes. They're growing right Exactly. Now. And, and We've, um, it's the coolest thing. It's this teeny little bit, and they are, they're growing stuff. As long as you have a very good um, nutrient content in the soil, you'd be amazed at what you can grow in small areas like that. Concrete We've grown 25 pounds of uh, tomatoes. And a um, little bowl was about this big, and that's because of the, the soil content and the amendments that we put in there, you know, with the compost and everything. So, you know, you don't need a lot of space to grow food. Even with the, um, the aquaponics that we're doing, we're going to, um, one greenhouse that we're going to have put together will have um, these tr uh, bunk beds, as I call them. They're these troughs, raised um, troughs over the canals that we're putting in. And we'll have four, um, four raised beds that will be 10 foot by 85 foot long. And we'll be able to grow over 180,000 pounds a year of fresh greens in those beds. And that's because of the nutrient that's coming from the fish and that's being broken down by bacteria turning into nitrites. And the plants absorb it readily. They act like a biological filter. So, you know, they readily absorb all this nutrient. So you're cutting your growth time in half and you're able to grow six times as much in, in the same area as you would in a garden. So, and that's, that cycle repeats itself every um, six weeks in the beginning. But as you build up a, a really good system, a back, you know, the bacteria in the system that you need and the nitrites and the water that the plants absorb, you break that down to four weeks and sometimes even three weeks, depending on how um, cycled your systems are. So can you so, do that with an aquarium? Right you now? can, actually. I've done it with aquariums. Um, the newspaper did a little write-up um, back uh, last December where I built this little system. It cost me $20 to build this little system. And I took it to the elementary schools to show the kids how it works. And I just put goldfish in there. Goldfish emit a lot of ammonia. Ammonia is what you need um, for the bacteria to process into nitrites. And the plants grew like mad. I mean, you had this little 10-gallon aquarium. And then we, we built this little bunk bed, basically. I took an old pallet. I, I made this bunk bed. And then we took a, a plastic, um, like a Tupperware bowl, and put it on the side to act as a clarifier or a filter. We put gravel in there and filter floss, and that's what saved the bacteria. If you have an aquarium, you know on the back you have the pump, right? And it acts as your biological filter. Well, that collects the bacteria, which breaks the ammonia down into nitrites. And that's what the plants absorb. So you can actually pump that aquarium water up to a shelf or a, a, a something stable, and the water would flow through to your plants, like your lettuces and your chards and you know all your leafy greens, your spinaches, and then back down to the fish. And the plants absorb all that out of the water. So effectively, your fish are actually going to grow quicker and be more healthier because you're taking out that ammonia and that nitrite out of the water because the plants are absorbing that. So whereas if you ever go to the aquarium store, you see ammonia remover, right? Mm -hmm. That's basically bacteria. They're selling you to break down the ammonia to turn it into nitrites. But you never see nitrite remover, do you? <laughs> no, they tell you to put plants in there, aquatic plants. Um, you can grow watercress. Watercress is one of the top ten super vegetables that benefit your body. It's got like four times as much iron in it. It has uh, than iron than um, spinach. It has high in calcium, high in vitamin D. You can grow watercress um, in your aquarium, and it, it can benefit you. You know, it can benefit you. So, yeah, there's a bunch of different things you can do. Like I said, YouTube, YouTube aquaponic aquariums, and you'll see these people have these big, beautiful aquariums, and then they grow their vegetables right on top on shelves. So, yeah, yeah. it is. It is. Can, can, uh, can I start? With Actually, now's a good time. If you got, if you got it, exactly. We, 
um, if you plant them right now, and you got, like I said, a really good content of, um, you know, compost in there, um, you can grow your brassicas now, and they'll be ready to be harvested by Thanksgiving. So, especially your kales. The Siberian kales will grow within five weeks. Um, your lettuces right now, you can grow lettuces within four weeks, baby cut lettuce that tall. Um, let's see, your cabbages, some of your cabbages will grow pretty quickly. They, they might be able to pick right at Thanksgiving or a little bit past Thanksgiving. But if you're planting your kales, your radishes, your turnips right now, um, you're, conserving your, you're conserving your runoff too. Um, because if anybody knows, and especially farmers, you always see they put a cover crop down. Um, and it's usually alfalfa because they can harvest it the next year. Or it's going to be um, winter wheat because they can harvest it the next year. Uh, we usually put in um, radishes, and we use tillage radish. Um, if you guys have small gardens, um, they have this radish called tillage radish, which is a um, hybridized version of Asian radishes. You ever see the daikons that get really long and the icicle radishes? Well, this tillage radish will actually, you plant it on top of um, clay compacted soil, and the root grows down, the tap root, and then it swells up. Well, if you leave it in the ground, what happens is when it decomposes, it leaves a cavity there. So you're effectively breaking up the soil. You're bringing the nutrients out of down 18 inches, and you're bringing it to the top, and it's breaking apart. So you have good organic compost already growing in your, in your gardens. Aeration by radish. Aeration by radish, yes. Um, beans. Tillage radish. Tillage radish, yep. Um, uh, broad beans. I go, I go to the stores, the international markets. I buy these big bags of faba beans or broad beans. I let them grow up in the garden, and then I mow them down and till it under. You're adding nitrogen to your soil. So you don't have to use, you know, liquid nitrogen the next year. So you break that down. You, you know, you mow it down. You till it under. You got your nitrogen, nitrogen right there. You take leaves. You see leaves all over the place. Oak leaves are the best kind of uh, fertilizer you can use for your garden. High in copper, high in magnesium. Um, we add lots of oak leaves in our, in our areas. What we do is we'll actually cut rows and we'll cut trenches with my middle buster. Um, the middle busters are used to pull up your potatoes, but they cut these beautiful trenches through our fields. We cut the trenches, we come through with the compost and we fill those trenches and then we till it back over. So you effectively, like the tillage radish, you have compost that's down low and then the soil on top, so that starts to break down. It loosens the soil, it sweetens the soil, and when you go back through to plant, you have this compost that's already in the ground. And if you continually do that for a period of two to three years, you raise the nutrient content in your soil. If you can have 10% nutrient content in your soil, you'll have the best garden in the world. Um, most of our soils, like Maryland soil, you might have 0.5%, uh, or I should say 0.05%, um, of nutrient content in the soil. But when you start adding more compost and adding more leaf debris, um, you bring it up to 1% to 2%. Your vegetables grow better in your fields. That's why the farmers have to use a lot of fertilizers because they've basically raped the ground by growing so many different things. It's taken all the nutrients out of the soil. So they have to use the harsh fertilizers um, in order to get their foods to grow. Because any, if anybody knows, when you plant a garden, if you have nice, healthy vegetables, you don't have a lot of bugs. But once you start having dying plants, it attracts the bugs because plants e emit ethanol when they start to die or get sick because the, decomposition, the decomposition of the plant emits that ethanol. And that's what the bugs like. That brings them in. And if you have nice, healthy, vibrant plants, you don't have a bad problem with pests. So you see where the bad cycle is. You have bad soil, you have weak plants. You have weak plants, you have pests. And that's where they come in with the petroleum-based fertilizers, the pesticides. And it's, it's, it's a, a very bad symbiotic relationship there. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, it, I don't think we're recording this so I want to make sure we're talking about the whole fertilizing on that. At the yeah. beginning, you talked about the relationship that you established with a, is it a horse farm? Yeah, the horse farms. Because you can't just, I mean, you, though you mentioned oak leaves are great, you can't just like toss the leaves down. They have to be mixed in. You, you got to, actually, you, you got to put them in a compost bin. Um, you right. can, you, you can till them. Down, Exactly. You, you go get horse manure. We, we go actually go get ho the horse compost, which horse is, compost. yeah, it's um, actually broken down. And you can go to just about any farm and ask them if you can have manure or compost, if they have composted uh, piles, and they'll give it to you because they have to pay to get rid of that. Yeah. Um, so in doing that, what we've done is we've gone around, since we moved, moved to the new farm, we, I'm 
very outgoing. <laughs> so we go and knock on doors, and I, I, I'll tell them, I know you guys got a horse farm here. What are you doing with the compost? What are you doing with the, the manure? And um, a lot of times they'll readily give it to us. And we take that and we put that in our fields. And if it's aged, it has to be aged. Um, horse manure is very acidic. Um, so you got to let it break down for a period of a, um, a year to 18 months. Um, and then it's good to, to add a little bit of, um, excuse me, you get you got to add a little bit of, um, oh, what am I thinking? Lime. And lime, you know, brings the acidity up, turns it alkaline. So um, if you let the horse compost age, you can put it in the fields. It helps your plants. Um, you can collect leaves. Um, I go around and I tell people, leave your leaves out. I'll, I'll come by and pick them up. Or we go around and get wood chips from the local um, the local uh, tree companies like Asplund. Asplund is a contractor for um, Frederick City. They'll go through and chip the uh, the. You know, they cut the trees, they chip them up, they have to take them to the dump, which is sometimes 20, 30 miles away. We tell them, hey, drop them at our farm, drop them on our farm sites. We go through and put the wood chips around our plants to control the, the weeds, but it controls what we have to do with watering, too. Um, the next year, we till that back into the ground. When wood chips break down, they create a fungus in the soil that's beneficial to your plants and the bacteria. So if you have a, a high content of wood chips in your soil, it breaks down slowly, but it brings a lot of beneficial um, components to your soil too. Your plants grow really well off of that. Um, if you do that for a couple years in a row, um, you're going to have monster plants. Uh, my little boy, in fact, this year, um, before we moved from our old house to our new farm, he, uh, we had this area. We composted and put wood chips in for two years in a row. Um, by mid-May, he had pumpkin leaves this big, and they were standing waist high. It looked like the little shop of horrors. I mean, it's just how, how they grew was amazing. And um, he grew all these pumpkins. By the, by the middle to the end of August, when we finally had to cut it down, um, we told him, go through, pick out your pumpkins. And he was pulling pumpkins this big. And he was pulling um, spaghetti squash. He probably, we pulled out probably 400 pounds of spaghetti squash out of that little area. And it was a 20 by 40 foot area where he planted all these seeds. And we just tilled them in. And um, it was just beautiful. And that's because of the soil content or the, the nutrient content with all the decomposing wood chips and the leaves and everything that we put in that area. So, yeah, thank you. <laughs> hey, you're welcome. We did a, uh, a Maryland food drop yesterday um, for the Fort Dietrich community. And um, everybody came up. And we've done a few of them for them now. And uh, everybody come up and they're like, we can't recognize you. You have shoes on today. 